password to continue. Okay. We're recording now. <clears throat> this is lecture seven of high dimensional probability and applications to data science. And it's Friday. And if you're watching us offline, if you cannot join us, then pause the recording and go get yourself some cup of coffee or tea and and continue enjoying this class with us. So uh, last time we proved our first uh, important result on concentration. So concentration of sums of independent random variables. In the last class, we proved our first result of that sort, which is, excuse me, which, which is called Höfding's inequality. To make things first very simple, we just take the simplest possible random variables for which life is difficult is um, life is easy for a Gaussian distribution. Life is more difficult for discrete distribution. So to make our point clear, we make we let's take the most discrete distribution ever and just work through it, which is Bernoulli. So let x1 through xn be independent and identically distributed random variables. And I'll abbreviate this as IID, independent and identically distributed. Symmetric Bernoulli. Symmetric Bernoulli random variable. Let's abbreviate it like this. Uh, let's uh, B symmetric Bernoulli IID random variables. And symmetric Bernoulli means that unlike usual Bernoulli, which take values zero and one, these random variables will take values minus one and one. It's a minor thing. Of course, you can translate one to the other, but it makes our life easier to consider the symmetric case because they automatically have mean zero, expected value zero. So this is symmetric Bernoulli. And we look at their concentration around the mean. Well, in this case, the mean is zero. So we sum this thing. Okay. We normalize it so that the variance becomes one. And for that is the reason why I divide by square root of n and not by n to make the variance equal one. And we prove this tail bound. The probability that it deviates, the sum deviates from its mean, which is zero, by at least t, that's our bad event, we want to bound it, is behaves as if the random variables were actually Gaussian, were normal distribution, chin. Just what you would expect from the central limit theorem, right? From the central limit theorem, you would expect that the normalized sum, uh, the normalized sum like this is approximately normal. And what we have here is the normal tail the Gaussian tail that, that's easy to prove. However, the step is incorrect, as we pointed out. We can't really argue that way. We can't really argue, okay, this is very sim similar to normal distribution, and therefore we just translate. No, the error is too large. So the approximation doesn't work, and we developed, um, we developed an alternative direct approach to this theorem, which is called the MGF method, very simple method. That was it. That's what we did last time. Did you do you have any questions or comments about this? No? Okay. Thank you, everybody who, who joined with the video. It really helped me. Thank you, Maria and Alexandra, Pablo, Constantine. Really, <laughs> really helps. Okay. A um, couple of remarks about, about Hoeving's inequality. First of all, well, people usually want not just the right tail, not just one tail, but they want double tail. 
obviously, right? So they want also this minus t. They want to say it really stays close to the expectation in both ways. And that's easy to obtain. So we'll call it two-sided tail bound. Easy by symmetry, by the symmetry. Um, so if I want the two-sided tail larger than t like this, put absolute value, right? So now I'm including the, the, the right tail and the left tail. Well, it breaks into the right tail like this and the left tail less than minus t. The right tail will rebound it by Hovding's inequality. This is this is just usual Hovding. Mm, here should be square root of n in the denominator. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Square root of n, of course. Thank you. Um, and the for the left tail, what you do is you use symmetry. You see, you can you can write it as maybe sum of minus xi is greater than t, something like this. I want to make it to a right tail. And then we, we say that minus xi has the same distribution as xi. Just think about it, right? It's a, xi is what? A symmetric Bernoulli. It takes value minus 1 and 1 with probability 1 half. Okay, so if you stick a negative sign, it will take values uh, uh, one and minus one, this probability one half, which is the same. So same probability, same distribution, and therefore this whole thing, the second term is also bounded by e to the minus t squared, also by Hovding inequality. And so the result is that uh, the entire thing is less than two e to the minus t squared. So if you want a double tail, two-sided tail, you pay a factor of two, obviously, and no surprises here. But, okay, this is the first and almost, almost trivial remark. You have two tails, of course, you multiply by two. Okay, perfect. Second remark is less trivial, um, is how far can this method go, right? We proved it for a very, very specific uh, distribution just for these random variables, plus or minus one, nothing else. The method was flexible, and I will put the result in place right now, which is the most general form of Hovding's inequality, in a sense. This is, this is how far it can go without, actually without too much effort. So this is Hovding's inequality. You can do the same, just the same proof for any bounded uh, random variables, not just Bernoulli. And here is how it goes. So let x1 through xn be independent random variables. Identical distribution is not needed. What's needed is the boundedness. xi lies in some interval, a i, b i, let's say, for any i. We need to contain them in some, some interval. Then, if you look at their sum, the sum of xi, this time I don't normalize because I, at this point I don't know how to normalize. The variance is not given to us, so I'm not, I don't know how to do that. So then the sum satisfies the following table inequality. First of all, they, the mean is not necessarily zero now. We don't know what the mean is, so I subtract it just to make the mean zero. The deviation from the mean is e to the minus t squared. That's a good thing. Same thing, t squared. And then of course, it, it the power depends on, uh, on how spread these random variables are. And this is how, it, how the, the spread is measured. We just sum the squares of the spread 
like this. And the, the proof is, I will not do it. It's, it's very similar to, to last time. We'll actually do a kind of a proof such as this to, today too, but you sweat a little bit and you get this result. Um, is the result itself clear? Yeah. The more spread random variables are, the more difficult they are to control, of course. And that's the, the larger is the, 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 in the numerator. The smaller is this thing. The smaller is this power. And the less control we have on the sum. Right? So it's e to the minus t squared, for example, divided by 100. It's a very spread thing, very weak thing. So that, that, that's natural. Now, just to make sure that we can apply it to, actually, let's skip that. Yeah. Let's... A little, I'll just put it as an exercise. Exercise check that this general theorem implies the Hovding's inequality that we proved for, for the symmetric distribution. And the constant is actually accurate. I think it will be bi is, uh, yeah, bi is one and a i is minus one. So you have two here, the spread is two, two squared is four, and two divided by four is two, and that's how you get t squared over two. So it's not something else. So you, these two results are consistent. Let me just. Okay, good. Now, if you look at, if, if you're interested how to do this, go look at Wikipedia and it, it just goes you, walks you through the steps of proving this exactly like we did the general form. Okay, this is useful. So you just need what, if you, if you, if you forget Hoeding's inequality, you just need to remember one thing that for any bounded distribution, you, you have a good control on the, of the sums, you have concentration of the sum. Any questions? Okay, good. Great result, but there is a very important weakness, unfortunately. And that's how people look at this result and say, sometimes it doesn't work. And what is the weakness of this result? It is insensitive to the variance of Xi. Let's say I just I just care that xi is in this interval. What if xi is like a Gaussian distribution with very, very small variance around the middle of this interval or, or something, like and then cuts off? Very, very, very almost deterministic, let's say. What if it's almost deterministic? Well, would, would, if it's almost deterministic, then we'll be, we should be sure, more sure about its location. So the power of concentration should be better. But the power of concentration is not better here. It just depends on the spread, on the absolute minimum and absolute maximum that this random variable takes. It's insensitive to the actual spread. You see, the actual spread of a random variable is usually determined by the variance. That's or the standard deviation. That's that's kind of the essential spread, and that is that result is insensitive to that. It just so it just says, okay, from the random variable is from this to this, but the actual spread is not there. So let's note this the weakness of this result is that insensitive to um, to what do you say to the to the average spread to the average spread of xi for example, the variance of X size. Right. Let me give you a very specific example where this will fail and, and where we want something else. Example. Let's say X i are Bernoulli random variables with parameter P. And that means that it is a, it's a biased coin. Biased coin, so probability of xi equal one, 
is p and probability that xi equals zero is one minus p. So we look at a biased coin with probability of p going to zero, very, very small. So it's a very rare event, very, very, very biased coin. It does, almost doesn't come up heads. The concentration here should get better. Agree, this is a very biased coin. Let's see if, if P is zero, actually, or all very close to zero. The concentration should get better. Because the coin becomes almost deterministic as P goes to, to infinity. We should, we're more and more sure that we will not get the heads. So we should get better result. But Hoeveling's inequality doesn't get better. Because no matter how the coin is biased, AI is zero, BI is one, the spread. It takes value zero and one, that's it. So the, the right-hand side of Hoeveling's inequality tells us nothing about how, how that works, unfortunately. But that does make perfect sense, doesn't it? So we pretty much didn't assume much about our initial uh, distribution, so we didn't have any information about the anything at all, and we got a we got a pretty abstract task, and we received a pretty abstract solution for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually a good point. If we don't assume anything else, then this is the best you can you can do. You're right. So if we just assume that x i takes values between this and this, we turn out like we, we turn blind on x i. We just know that it, is, it takes values between zero and one. This is the best way you can hope. For. Even the constant is correct. What I'm saying is that well, maybe you don't turn the, the, the blind eye on this. Maybe you maybe you know something about XI. Maybe you know the variance, and the variance here, the variance of this Bernoulli distribution is maybe you remember this p times one minus p, so it goes down to zero as p goes to zero. So maybe you know that a piece of extra piece of information. If you do, can you do better? Can you do better for this Bernoulli even, this, this specific example? Um, yeah, so it's so you're absolutely correct. I'm not saying that we will take this assumption, this general assumption, and we'll try to prove a better result. That will be impossible. The assumption is too weak, too general. But we're throwing an extra piece in that assumption. We say, what if the variance is small? Or what is this is Bernoulli with P? Can we do better? OK? Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, let's now remember from, from what, do, what do we expect? Let's rem remember this. So we have this, suppose we have Xi, okay? Suppose we have Xi with Bernoulli, uh, Bernoulli, so we flip coins and P goes to zero, very, very rare chance of success. And then we sum them up. So we look at the number of successes. This, this becomes binomial distribution, as you may remember, the sum of successes with, uh, sorry, the number of successes in n trials with p very, very small, with p going to zero. Do you remember how to model this situation? It's like a, a rare disease, for example, right? The number of rare diseases in the, pub, in, in the city, uh, the number of accidents on the road on a given day, something like this, something, the number of earthquakes in a given year, or very rare, rare events. How do we model probabilistically their number? It's not, not by normal distribution anymore. There's something else. Poisson distribution. Mm -hmm. Poisson. Poisson. Have you heard? Yeah, Poisson distribution. And so this is, this is what Poisson distribution is for, is to modeling the number of rare events, such as diseases, rare diseases, accidents on the road, number of emergency calls, and stuff like that. So if, so let's say P goes to zero, Let's make this extreme case just just for to make this argument. Suppose p is actually scales as one over n, so that s n the expected value of the number of successes is fixed is mu. So you look at a lot and lot of trials, and you expect just a constant number of successes there. Um, for instance, you look you look at every second 
and at each second you can receive an emergency call at the police station or not. Lot and lot of seconds. But in all of this day, there are 10,000s of seconds I can remember. You only, on average, get like 10 calls. So that's, that's the situation we're modeling. Then, this is approximately Poisson distribution with parameter mu. And this is called Poisson limit theorem. <clears> that <throat> hopefully you did it in the uh, in the course uh, in the basic course of probability, but we'll I'll, I'll throw the theorem in today as well. Theorem Poisson limit theorem. Okay, let's state it formally. We have x one through x x one x two and so on. Suppose they are Bernoulli distributed with parameter mu over n. Is my notation okay, clear? Bernoulli distribution? So okay. there, this, yeah, okay. So that means that it ta they take values zero or one, probability of one is mu over n. That's, that's a standard notation for Bernoulli. Okay. Suppose they are independent. random variables, and we sum them up. Sum of the xi's from one to n converges to the Poisson distribution with parameter mu, and I'll explain what Poisson distribution is. In distribution, that's a technical term of the, about the mode of convergence. Um, so in the limit, you have Poisson distribution. Okay, what's Poisson? Let's let's recall this. The random variable is Poisson with parameter mu. If it takes, well, obviously it takes integer values, zero, one, two, and so on. Actually, the sum takes integer values too, so that's natural. And the probabilities are the following, x equals k with probability e to the minus mu, mu to the k divided by k factorial. So that's Poisson distribution. It looks like, uh, no, it looks something like this. It kind of a little resembles Gaussian distribution. Only one tail is slightly fatter and goes to infinity. Just probabilities. The expected value of Poisson is mu, and the variance is also with mu. These are the facts that, you know, the background facts that we probably know. Have you seen this before, Poisson? Yeah, course? sure. Yeah, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so that's Poisson distribution. It's not normal. The difference between central limit theorem and the Poisson limit theorem is the crucial difference is this. If this parameter, the probability of success is fixed, P, then we have the central limit theorem regime and the limit is normal. If the parameter, the probability of success is not fixed and is actually going to zero, such as here, mu divided by N, so that on average, the number of successes is constant, then it is Poisson regime. Okay, cool. So, wait, why are we discussing this again? Let's go back. We, we discussed this because we said Hövdings is not sensitive to the real, like, real spread, real uh, variance of excise. And we want to make it more dramatic by saying, okay, let's take a random variable with the same spread as Bernoulli, classical Bernoulli from zero, zero 01, 
and what was very 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 tight concentration but like a mu over n for example so the total number of successes is is fixed then Hoeffding's inequality would be weak for that because it is insensitive to that tightness and we actually we, we can't ex even ex now we know that we can't even expect anything like normal tail here we should expect different thing we should expect Poisson tail we should compare the thing that we the, the thing that we compare it to is wrong it should not be comparing to normal it should compare to that Poisson okay so what's Poisson tail what do we expect then Poisson tail if x is Poisson what do we expect of the tail let's see probability that x is greater than t let's say one-sided tail it's like that from t on one-sided tail mm, well these are the probabilities so we should just what which is sum sum of all these probabilities starting from from t and onward um e to the minus mu mu to the Actually, let's take e to the minus mu out, e to the minus mu, and then the sum and onward, mu to the k of k factorial. It's not, a, not an easy sum because of the factorial. Uh, but I did a little bit of an experiment with MATLAB, and if you use if you use um, Hoeffding's inequal, oh, sorry, if you use Stirling's approximation to the factorial, which is essentially k to the k. Remember, k factorial is something like I think this is a good approximation. E, e k to the k. I always forget k divided by e or e. It's e. No, it should k divided by e maybe. Something like that. So k to the k. Then the tail becomes. Then okay, just just think. What do we expect here? So, so we're summing these things. K to the k factorial is like k to the k, and this 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 so the series decays. The terms of the series decay rapidly. K one, one over k to the k goes down. So this the sum the total sum of the series should be dominated by. The first term, the first or second term, because then, then it decays very rapidly. And the first term is like k to the k, actually mu, mu to the k divided by k to the k. And so, so it's only natural to have that here, mu to the k divided by k to the k. And there is uh, and there is e because of the Stirlings. And there is t, not, not k, right? Uh, t, t, you're right. T, first term. Yeah, so that's just a little exercise to, uh, to do. And we have this table. That's Poisson too. Okay, now, now let's look. And as we look at this, we say, oh, oh my goodness, this is. This is not like this is doesn't look like e to the minus t square root. It doesn't look like Gaussian tail at all. It looks more like let's forget this e thing, but it looks more like t to the minus t, which is e to the minus t log t. So it's heavier, right? T log t is smaller than t squared over two. So that's a, that's a heavier tail. Heavier than, than the Gaussian tail. So plus one is, is not, right, it's okay, it's still exponential, but it's heavier than the Gaussian tail. But the moral of this story is that we should not be expecting any, any miracles here. We should not be expecting a tail like this. For all t, well, simply because the Gaussian tail is too good. It's too light. The actual the, the reality is heavier. We, the, the, that'll be a contradiction. So we need some different result. And we can't really just go and improve Hoeffding's inequality. That'll be a contradiction. Generally. 
So what do we expect now? Well, now we know we we should expect that the sum of these Bernoulli random variables, the SN, to behave similarly. So we should expect probability that SN is greater than T to be approximately less, maybe bounded by, by the Poisson tail to the T. That's our, that's our hope, right? So again, the logic is this. The sum converges to Poisson. Poisson has this tail. Therefore, we expect that the sum has also Poisson tail. We can't, logic is faulty. Just like in the central limit theorem, the approximation is too bad. We, we can't really expect that to get from, from Poisson limit theorem. The approximation error will dominate. So again, let's make a direct, direct move on that. And that is actually true. Yay. That's our next result, which is called Chernoff. Chernoff's inequality. Which is somehow more feels more powerful than than uh, Hövding's for for Bernoulli distribution. So here's the situation. Let x i be Bernoulli. Different p's are okay. Let me see. Be independent random variables, and then we uh, we look at their sum. I we look at its mean because we'll subtract the mean basically right so the mean is the expected value well the expected value of each xi is pi right so then we sum them up pi and call this mu and here is a tail less than e to the minus mu, e mu divided by, and of course I made a error here, t, t to the power t. It's exactly like the Poisson tail. Perfect, Much wonderful result, no, no, no approximation, nothing. It, doesn't you know and doesn't need to go to infinity or anything like that everything is finite it works perfectly fine for any finite sample for any mu any p uh we don't even have to assume the poisson regime here we don't have to we don't have to assume that these pis are very small it actually works generally so that's another surprise so in particular This holds if uh, if all the Bernoullis are the same, if all the PIs are the same, and so as n would be binomial distribution with n trials and probability of success. Okay, I want the total number of successes to be mu, so each success comes with probability mu over n. Okay, now we'll prove this. Any questions about the statement, about this logic, how the Poisson logic here, our motivation? Yeah, perfect, okay. Proof, basically we repeat the same proof and it's so nice, so important, the, the MGF proof that it totally makes sense to repeat it again. So MGF method again. We want the tail, and we want the exponential kind of exponential tail. So it makes sense to exponentiate. So we exponentiate both sides uh, with some base, and and the base is up to us. So uh, we choose a parameter. To be determined later, we'll then 
optimize that parameter. But for now, we exponentiate with that parameter. So it's e to the minus lambda Sn greater than e to the minus lambda T. Multiply both sides by lambda and exponentiate. Okay. Cool. Okay, now we use Markov inequality. And Markov inequality tells us that this tail is bounded by the expected value of whatever random variables here. Oops. Divided by the right-hand side e to the lambda t. Markov, perfect. Okay, uh, then uh, uh, then what? Then we then we recall that S n is the sum. And so e to the sum is the product of e to the lambda xi's. This is just by definition, Sn is the sum of xi's. And here's the beauty of, of, of this method is that now we can swap expected value and the product because of in, because of the independence. An expected value of x, y equals expected value of x times expected value of y if x and y are independent. And here we have n independent from the variables, so that's why. Expected value of the product is product of expectations. P product, expected value of e to the lambda x i's. And all these, all the terms are the same. They're all equal. Oh, no, they're not all equal. This time we're, sorry, if, yeah, if, if I, if we assumed that P i's are all the same, then they would be equal. But this time they're not equal. Not necessarily, so. So we'll stop here. At any rate, what we, uh, uh, what we have here is a much, much simpler quantity than let's say this tail before. Why? Because the sum of independent random variables is a difficult object. How do you know why? The sum is very... Now we factored it and reduced to one individual random variable. We're handling one variable at a time and that's much easier. And this expectation of e to the lambda xi, that is called the MGF, the moment generating function. Wonderful. And yeah, let's 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 compute this separately for each term. All right, that's gonna be easy. This is it's uh, expected value of anything is is what. It's the value of the random variable times the probability that it takes this value, plus the value times probability, plus the value times probability, and so on. And there are two values here. There's value zero, uh, sorry, there's value one. Xi can take value one with probability pi, and it takes value zero with probability one minus pi. So this is, this is one, obviously. And let's rearrange the terms. So it will be one plus, and there is e to the lambda minus one, I believe, pi. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's all right. Okay, now what's our goal? Whatever we do, we will need to multiply these things. Right. Whatever bound we, we have, we need later to just put this and multiply them out. It would be hard to multiply something like this. The easiest thing is to multiply are exponentials. So I would we would like we would love to have this be like uh, e to the something. E of expect expectation oh, sorry exponential of something because then it will be easier to multiply this exponential. It's just a sum of exponents. So let's do this. Well, we have one plus something. 
this one plus x is less than e to the what? <laughs> x. E to the x is here. One plus x is here. E to the x sits above one plus x. That's a, that's the first Taylor expansion, if in fact. So if the first term, the first two terms of Taylor expansion of e to the x. So that's that's true. So this so we have e to the e to the lambda minus one pi. Okay, perfect. And then I'll put here, I'll put like a less than or equal to, and we're, we're continuing that. That line is less than what? So this is e to the minus lambda t stays. And then we multiply this exponentials, multiply the exponentials. So I, I need to sum the exponents. So the sum to the lambda minus one, sum of the pi's. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, just take this bound and put it directly here and multiply them. We get that, obviously. Oh, okay. Some of the PIs, that's our mu. That's a mean of that distribution. So that's great. By definition, this is mu. And so the, the formula that we have is e to the minus lambda t plus e to the lambda minus one mu. Okay, yeah, I think, I think we're good. So what now? So we get our, we wanted to bound this. Well, here's a bound. What are the parameters here? Mu, that's our expectation. And what is lambda? And lambda is arbitrary. Lambda is in our hands. Lambda is a handle that we can, like a joystick that we can, we can play with. I right? see so it works. This works. This bound works for arbitrary lambda. And like before, we just well, let's choose the best one. If it holds for arbitrary, why don't we choose the best one? So we need to minimize. Want to make this bound as small as possible. So we optimize or we minimize. This bound in lambda, and and you do this, you take the derivative. It's very easy. You take derivative equate with zero, and we get this bounded by by e to the mu e mu over t to the t. Done. We'll exercise to minimize and then put the, the this expression. Hey, any questions here? You good? I have the question about the a lot no, about the statement previous to this when you were referencing the Poisson limit theorem. Yes. Which was the motivation, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, what does uh, so you are saying that x one, x two, and so on have a Bernoulli distribution with mu divided by capital N? But mm -hmm. What does that exactly mean? So. How is it dependent on? So th there are infinitely many of x's, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and you, uh, then you sum to to the capital N, and I don't understand what that exactly means. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So so you're asking something like this: uh, we uh, that in this process we actually change the distribution of x one, right? Because in the first step it was like yeah. mu over one, and the second step is mu over two, mu over three. So x one kind of changes its meaning every time. So you're right. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm actually quite, I have a question about what exactly, is, is it supposed to be mu divided by i or? No, no, mu divided, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I, uh, let's, this, this, yeah, you're right. So this statement is not, it's not too rigorous. So let's make this, that, that thing. So this, this random variables for, okay, for any n, for any n, we we select our we flip the coins and the coins have probability mu over n. 
Okay, then for new n, we flip new coins. So this random variables here are actually different. There's is is this now better? So we okay, change and, and the, the yeah, and, and the convergence still holds, right? Oh. And the convergence yeah. holds in distribution, yes. It it still holds, yes. Okay. Uh, I... So, so we don't actually have infinite amount of uh, random variables for each given n. We have exactly n. So there is x1, x2, and so on, xn. So there mm -hmm. are n of them. And this statement holds for all n. Is that correct? That this, No, the statement holds. No, not, not, not holds for what we have in the limit. It uh, limits by distribution to, to the. What yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. That's in probability theory. That's called the triangular array, uh, which is this. So we have. For, for n equal 1, we have x11. One, one. For n equal 2, we have x11, one, one, x12. One, uh, sorry, the second level, we have x12. Uh, two, two. Third level, x1, x2, x3, but they're different. So the third version of this. <laughs> and so on. So we have the triangular array for each level. This is n level, like n equal 1, n equal 2 n equal three for each n for each level n we have n random variables and this kind of widens up and the convergence holds like this so if you if n goes to infinity then the distribution of the sum can becomes closer and closer to, to Poisson distribution yeah if I guess you know the modes of distribution it's not the almost sure convergence here it's it's a weak convergence so or convergence and distribution same thing so this means that we don't have to kind of couple these random variables together. We don't have to equate these coins around the levels. That's that's fine. But if you don't know that, that's good. But did I clarify this situation, or there is still some confusion? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But okay, I'm glad. <laughs> Thank you for asking. That's that was a good good question. I uh, and the statement is now rigorous. I think. Okay, perfect. We got a result. It's a weird, weird bound. Right? Normal tail, easy. E to the minus t square over two. What is what is this about? E mu t t e to the mu. This is this is very complicated. Let's try to demystify it. Let's look at the. Um, so when t goes to infinity. When t goes, when t is large, so it's large deviation regime, then we have. Let me put it here. Uh, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, what does uh, this uh, inequality mean for t equal to zero? Because you're right for oh, yeah. any t. Uh... It means nothing, right? So it should be greater than. <laughs> Yeah, because if we had something okay. infinity to the power of zero, it could be one, but uh, yeah. then e to the yeah. power of minus uh, mu is uh, less than one. Of course, yeah, that would not be very good. Yeah, for t equals zero, yeah. Um, but in fact, zero to the zero limit, as limit of t to the t as limit of t to the t as t goes to zero is what is one i think right yeah it's this goes to one as t goes to zero so if if as t approaches zero we have we have one i think right the right hand side approaches one e to the mu and then uh, e to the power of uh, Minus mu, I think. Hmm. That's the problem. So it must approach something like uh, one, ideally. Stephen Kerr. Okay, now I'm confused because it's. Ah, no, 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 no. Wait a second. No, I think it's okay. Yeah, okay. That's a nice thing. Okay, let's do it. Let's make this exercise. Maybe I'll I'll copy this and copy this to the next page, and we'll make this little asymptotic analysis. Paste. Okay. 
let's check. So if T approaches zero, what would the right hand side be? So T to the T would then converge to one, right? It's going to be zero because T to the T is E to the T log T. Can I ask why T to the T? Why not T uh, to minus T? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, T to the minus T, yeah. T to the minus T. Mm -hmm. T to the minus T is one divided by that. So I, I, I just give the minus sign, yeah. But let's say, yeah, T to the minus T, okay. So that uh, that approaches, so the right hand side approaches zero. This, so, okay, yeah, yeah. So this goes to zero, I believe, because log logarithmic growth is slower. And so this approaches one. So the right hand side, our bound becomes e to the minus mu. And then there is e to the mu to the t divided by t to the t. And that approaches, so that, that thing, that thing converges to one. And we get, this converges also to one. And we get it e to the minus mu. So we get this bound probability Sn greater than zero in particular is less than e to the minus mu as we take this limit. Is it is it even correct? Uh, but uh, why why does it have con uh, continuity? Uh, because it's something. Yeah, we don't have continuity, right? Yeah. Because something I'm very afraid. strange with uh, very small probabilities. So it yeah, would yeah. be logical that it is uh, very dense near zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So on the right hand side, of course, we have some kind of we, we can take the limit, but on the left hand side, we cannot really. On the left hand side, we have this probability is discrete. So when we take this limit, we'll get something like this. We'll never hit zero exactly. Yeah, so I have to exclude zero. Otherwise, it's okay, right? It's, so I slide. No, no, I, uh, why? Why can't we hit zero? I, I, I don't get it. S n can perfectly be zero. It it can, but as yeah. I, but as I take t as I uh, in, decrease t to zero, I make t smaller and smaller and smaller, and take the intersection of these events. It never includes the event Sn equals zero. Right? Sn is greater than one, Sn is greater than one half, Sn is greater than one fourth. All these events exclude Sn equals zero. So in the limit, this, this, this event is still excluded, hitting zero. Um, it's similar to when you have when you have the intervals like this from Sn onward, for, sorry, for, sorry, from t to infinity, and then you take their intersection as t goes. To infinity. So intersection of these intervals as t goes to as t goes to zero is actually uh, the interval with zero excluded. So union union of these intervals. Okay, so we have this, and does it make sense? Does it not contradict anything? As n greater than zero, that that's the same as probability. That's well, Sn is the sum of independent random, just a sum. So it, this is the same as one minus the probability that Sn greater, Sn equals zero. Could I make an assumption on this matter? Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, it, the probability of Sn equal to zero should be something one minus uh, P1 uh, multiplied by one minus P2, but if we take the natural uh, logarithm of this, <laughs> this will be something very close to uh, P1 plus P2 plus ah, uh, yeah, et cetera, yeah, et cetera, yeah. plus uh, P and big. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's nice. Okay, I like that idea. Okay, okay, Vladislav, I'll, I'll uh, follow with your idea then. So this probability is clear. That's that's clear, right? So it's greater than zero. We just need to exclude zero. So it's one minus that. Okay. So what is this? Probability that sn equals zero means that every single random variable has to be zero. So x one is zero, and x two is zero, and all of them, all n of them, 
are equal to zero. They're independent. So this means that the probability of x1 equals zero, that's one minus p1, and probability of x2 is one minus p2, and so on and so forth. So we get the product, one minus pi is like this. And then it's hard to multiply the product, but this is approximately very close. Pi's are small, so let's say pi is small. This is very close to e to the minus pi's. It's second term of Taylor expansion. So actually, like, and why are pi's small? And uh, also generally, if we take one, even one of the pi's is very large because this is one of the assumptions that pi's are arbitrary. So if one of the pi's is very large, close to one, that mm -hmm. means that p s n uh, greater than zero will be very close to one. And if the e to the, mm, mm, yeah, mm -hmm. doesn't, it, doesn't it contradict? So e, e to the minus mu will be less than one. Um, well, one of them can be one. That's all right. If one, if one of the pi's is, oh. Yeah, you're right. So if pi, if one of the pi's, let's say it's the first one. Uh, hmm. Well, if one of the pi's is one, that's weird, right? Yeah. I think there should be something uh, analogous to the uh, natural logarithm of uh, one plus x, uh, not more than x, but for a natural logarithm of one minus x, probably yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah, that, it goes both ways, logarithmically, in cave. So that's what. But the, the problem is that we have a formal contradiction here, don't we? If and the, so you're you're someone is saying if pi is let's say if p1, for example, the first one, if p1 is one, let's assume that so it's a it's a it's a sure event. Yeah. So if p1 is one, okay, here's the logic. So p1 is one. That means that x1 is 1 deterministically. x1 always happens. And if x1 is 1, then Sn is automatically greater than 0, like all the time, deterministically. And, and that fails. Because e to the minus mu is less than 1, and this equals 1. So 1 is less than 1, and that's. Hmm. But. It's very strange. Does anyone know? Anyone see the problem? The cause of the problem? They don't. Hmm. Probably it would be easier if uh, you could switch to the proof. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the result is correct though. But uh, yeah, here is a proof. <clears throat> and T is very small for example. Huh. That's weird. Hey guys, let's think together. Your collective brain power is needed here. Either find the mistake or find the mistake in our country example. Can have both. Very good. 
one always. So in fact, the way the country example works, uh, I'm, I'll switch back later, but the way the country example works, let me, let me clear this room here. Delete. Okay, so here, what is our, what, what is our example that kind of invalidates this, this theorem or supposed to invalidate is X1, sorry, P1 equals one. Therefore, X1 equals one deterministically. Therefore, Sn is greater than one, let's say, deterministically with probability one. With probability one. So, so the left-hand side is equals one. It's always greater than zero here. And the right-hand side is strictly less than one. And that's the problem. Now, this problem works even if n equal one. Right? This example works just for one random variable. It's not a so. Therefore, the the root of this problem is not how we handle the sum. The root of this problem co caused by one single random variable. So the the problem. Let's debug this 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 code. So the the problem cannot be. Here, basic, not how we handle the sums. So let's. Uh, so there is no product here. It's just one random variable. And for this random variable, we have e to the lambda times one. This will be one, plus nothing here. Pi is actually gone. Pi is one. I'm trying to debug that specific case. So it's e to the lambda. So that whole thing is just e to the lambda. And e to the lambda. Uh, okay. So if if we if we look at this as one plus e to the lambda minus one, then this this holds. So pi is gone. So because one plus something is less than exponential of that something. That's true. So we get e to the minus lambda t, e of that something that is gone. Now, so mu is one. So did I do the differentiation, the, the optimization incorrectly maybe? Because that's the only thing that's hidden here. I don't know. So it's minus lambda t plus e to the lambda minus one. And I would like to optimize this in lambda. So I would like to take the minimum of that. I differentiate, this is zero. I get minus t in lambda. I'm differentiating lambda minus t plus e to the lambda is zero. So e to the lambda equals t. So t is natural logarithm of lambda. Let's do ln, ln lambda. And uh, no, lambda is. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Lambda is ln of t. And then this expression, becomes minus t ln t plus e to the lambda minus one. Okay, let's exponentiate that. So the probability is exponential of that. And, and e to the lambda is, is t. Oh yeah, and e to the lambda is t, yes. Plus t minus one. Okay, so we have one becomes e to the minus one. That's our that's our e to the minus mu. And here we have the first term becomes, I guess, t to the minus t, e to the minus t ln t, yes. And the second term becomes e to the t. 
So we get e to the minus one, e over t to the t, which cons is consistent with this. Ha, huh? what's, what's going on here? So that step was correct too. I think I uh, see it in the small <laughs> flow, but yeah, uh, yeah. it doesn't think, uh, fix the problem, <laughs> unfortunately. E to the power of T mu and not E mu to the power of T. Sorry, Blaise, can you say it again? I, I, where is it? Uh, exponent, uh, exponent, uh, ex, <laughs> exponent of T mu and not uh, <laughs> E mu to the power of t. You see, you here. Yes, I think it's e to the power of t mu. Okay, that's going to be our next problem. <laughs> <If that's, laughs> but right now it doesn't, fix. One, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, for this example, yeah, I agree. So for this, it doesn't solve the problem. For this example, mu is one anyway, so it really doesn't matter where mu is. Um, Yeah, so for this example, as if t if t goes to zero, then this goes to e to the minus one as t goes to zero. And e to the minus one is in an incorrect thing. It should be one and not e to the minus one. How can this be? What's going on here? Give me a break. Can you please repeat the argument? Why is it should be? Why should it be one? Again? Yeah, it should be one because our in our example we have just one single random variable, mm -hmm. so n equal one, one single random variable, x one that for which holds determinate which equals one deterministically so p1 equal one so probability one ah, and sn is always one uh, exactly. greater than one uh, okay. exactly yeah in this this particular example actually it is one equals one with probability one and what we what we're getting is a probability that sn is greater than t is greater than zero converges to e to the n equals, I guess, less than or equal e to the minus one from, from this argument. And that is incorrect because e to the minus one is less than one. It should be one. What's going on? Go on. It's very, very simple proof. I got it. You got it. Uh, we we have to switch <laughs> the sign of inequality if lambda is uh, negative uh, yeah, in the lambda, beginning. Lambda is lambda should be always positive. And but, uh, but if uh, oh, t yeah? is small, then oh. lambda is negative. Oh yeah, you got it. Totally, exactly. Okay, who said that? Vladislav, right? Yeah, that's me. You got the badge of honor. You saved the save the day. Yes. Um, wow, that was good. So, guys, this is this is the problem. In in this specific example. The optimal choice for lambda is logarithm of t. t goes to zero, right? We, we drive t to zero. Logarithm will be negative as t goes to zero. So lambda will be negative. And we can't have negative lambda because in this example, we first multiply both sides by lambda and then exponentiate. And when we multiply by something negative, the inequality uh, changes. It's no longer valid. <laughs> See the problem and probably for any t more or equal to one exactly yay okay we got it 
So any t, let's say greater than 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 mu, mu, because uh, I believe, and it's already getting late, but I believe that if you do this optimization for general case, I'll put this in uh, this. So lambda will be logarithm. The optimal choice is logarithm of t divided by mu. That's that's an optimal. If you differentiate, you'll see that. Yeah, that's right. It's you're right. So for this to be positive, t has to be greater than mu. And that's that was very important because we have to keep this inequality and that's that was a problem. Okay. Woo! Goodness gracious. Okay. Um thank you, Vladislav. This is really, 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 really good catch. And and then let's just make one last thing so we can sleep peacefully tonight. I just want to make sure that this is still not a contradiction if t goes to mu now. So suppose t converges to mu. That's that's an edge of the allowed region. Then the right hand we'll side. One, exactly one. one. Exactly, yeah. Actually, we can, yeah, we can actually get it equal to mu exactly and we get equal mu e mu and t cancels e to the t e to the t and we get t equals mu so we get one okay perfect perfect so if if t equals mu then this is one and that's exactly what we want yeah probability is the worst kind of upper bound is one obviously and then it gets gets better as you as you go in now this assumption is nat is only natural because after all Sn does not have mean zero it has mean mu right so our deviation should be around the mean so we should should make t larger than mu and not from zero yeah okay okay people i i you for so long today so any other questions let's stop recording <laughs>